Having said that, would you please now stand and let's give our undivided attention to the reading of God's Word. We're going to pick up in verse 12. I know Hunter touched on that, but we're going to pick up in verse 12 and we'll go down to verse 17. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> in verses 12 through 14, we see the work of the Father through the Son. We're going to look at that in a moment. But then in verse 15, all the way through verse 23, we see the focus is entirely on the preeminent one, the incomparable Christ. We'll, talk, we'll hit half of that part this week, and Lord willing, we will see next week verses 18 through 23. All right. In verse 14, I'm going to come back to 12 through 14 in a minute, but in verse 14, Paul begins a list of 15, yes, 15, not 14, not 16, 15 breathtaking truths about Jesus Christ. And this section of scripture is probably the most concentrated description of the glories of Jesus Christ in the entire Bible. Now, that's a lofty statement, I know. But I want you to take your pencil or your pen and just put a dot beside these. Okay, I'm going to go through them rapid fire. And again, we won't have time to get through all of these today. But here's what John Piper says about this section of Scripture. He says, This list that Paul gives us is worth memorizing. If your heart ever wavers, if your heart ever grows cold, go to this portion of God's word. Memorize this list of glories and ask God to give you affections that correspond to the measure of this greatness. He says this, put ballast or weight in the belly of your boat so that when waves crash against your life, you will not be capsized. Here they are. Verse 14, in him, that is Christ, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Number two, verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God. Number three, he is the firstborn of all creation. That is the specially honored first in rank son over all creation. Number four, verse 16, by him, that is by Christ, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities. Number five, verse 16 as well, all things were created through Jesus. Number six, all things were created for Jesus. Verse 17, he is before all things. Number eight, in him all things hold together. Now, that's as far as we're going to get today, but let me give you the rest of them. Number nine, he is the head of the body that is the church. Number 10, he is the beginning. Number 11, he is the firstborn from the dead. Number 12, and we're in verse 18 here. In everything, he is preeminent or has first place. Number 13, verse 19, in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Number 14, verse 20, he reconciles all things to himself, whether on earth or in heaven. And lastly, also in verse 20, 
He makes peace by the blood of his cross. Wow. 15 skyscraper descriptions of Jesus Christ in this concentrated portion of God's word. I love how how Piper says that. Put ballast in the belly of your boat so that when waves crash against your life, you will not be capsized. Okay, let's go back to verse 12. I said there's in verses 12 through 14, we see the work of the Father through the Son, and then we'll change gears in verse 15 and following. It's exclusively focused on the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Verse 12 and following. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So, the Father is qualifying certain people, okay? The church here in Colossae, but by application, anyone who has called upon Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins as Lord and Savior. What does it mean that he has qualified us? Literally, the Greek word means to make sufficient, to make one fit for a particular task or a particular privilege. So the Father has qualified us for what? To share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Let that wash over you for just a minute. This is going to humble you. It's going to humble me as well, but that's good, right? God, he exalts the humble and he humbles the exalted. What this means is that on our own, left to ourselves, we are unfit. We are insufficient to lay claim to or to enjoy the gracious inheritance that God has prepared for his children. In order for us to become fit for that, to become sufficient for that, he had to do something for us and he had to do something in us. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But first, what is the inheritance that we have been made fit for? We've talked a little bit about this in verses 1 through 8. One aspect of the inheritance that is yours and mine through Christ by being in Christ is eternal life. And we've been taught well at this church that eternal life doesn't begin simply when you close your eyes in death. That's part of it. But eternal life begins when you repent and believe in Christ. It's not just a, a quantity of life waiting for us in heaven. It's, it's a quality of life that's ours right here, right now. That's part of our inheritance. Another aspect of our inheritance is found in Matthew 5, 5. Blessed are the gentle or the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Part of your inheritance, brother and sister, is that you will reign and rule with Jesus Christ in the new heavens and the new earth for all of eternity. A third aspect is all of the blessings that God could pour into Christ. And then you, in Christ, you share in all of those eternal blessings. But all of those are just footnotes at the bottom of the page because the best of what we would describe as our inheritance is God himself, Christ himself, fellowship with him face to face forever and ever and ever. We already have it now to some degree, but the best is yet to come. We will enjoy these blessings. We will enjoy our God, our Christ more fully in the future, <clears throat> the verb tense here means that this has already begun. And we see scriptures that corroborate that conclusion. Romans chapter 8, for example, says that you currently right now are co-heirs, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. 
1 Peter 1, 4. We talked about that when we went through 1 Peter. But listen to this, 1 Peter 1, 4. To obtain an inheritance, that's future tense, which is imperishable and undefiled and will never fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Hebrews 9.15 speaks of the eternal nature of the inheritance that God has given to each of his children. So we enjoy this now, but the, there's more to come. The best is yet to come. Now, how did that become yours? I said, left to yourself, you're unfit for that inheritance. Left to your own devices, you would never be qualified to enjoy that inheritance. Not in this life and not in the one to come. So what did God do in us and for us that has made us fit, that has made us qualified? We'll look at verse 13. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Literally, the kingdom of the son of his love. And of course, he's speaking of Jesus. When did that take place? How did that take place? That you and I and this group of Colossae believers were in the domain, under the domain of darkness, but something happened to them so that they have been taken out of Satan's authoritative realm of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of light, the kingdom of his beloved son, Jesus. Well, theologically speaking, this is speaking of regeneration. When the Father, by the Spirit, makes someone who is spiritually dead in his or her trespasses and sins, who is marching to the beat of Satan's drum, where he makes that person now alive to God, that's regeneration, and then conversion is the other side of that coin where that person now made alive by the Spirit now turns from his or her sin, turns from that darkness, and turns toward the light or turns toward Jesus Christ. That's faith. So theologically speaking, we're speaking of regeneration and conversion where God the Father through the work of the Spirit makes us alive and then we turn from sin in repentance and turn to Christ by faith for the forgiveness of our sins. That's where this is, this is heading. See, the Father can do this, has done this for us and in us based upon what His Son Jesus Christ did on the cross. Do you see that at the end of verse 14? He says, In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Hold your finger there and scroll down to verse 20 because he's going to uh, pick up on that idea of Christ forgiving us and cleansing us. Verse 20, And through him, that is through Christ, to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through whom I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. So, God did that in this church, this group of Christians gathered together in Colossae. And God did that in you, my friend. If you are a Christian, that kind of explains how you became a Christian. What took place from God's perspective? From our perspective, we think one day we just woke up and said, you know what, I'm tired of sin and, and, and the consequences of sin. I'm ready to... I'm ready to turn to Jesus. But we see that behind the curtain, something was happening. God the Father, through the work of the Spirit, had made you alive. And you had then turned from the darkness in repentance and turned toward the light in faith in Christ. And you were forgiven. And you were forgiven. Uh, there's so many verses I could share here with you. But let me just share two with you that speak of this idea of repent for the forgiveness of your sins or believe for the forgiveness of your sins. They're two sides of the same coin. Luke chapter 24, verse 46 through 47. 
Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in His name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Acts chapter 10, verse 43, speaking now of faith, not repentance, but faith. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him, that is in Jesus, will receive the forgiveness of their sins. So, this word redemption in verse 14 and forgiveness, oh, these are too rich to pass over in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This word redemption, you probably are thinking in terms of, of slavery. You know, a slave is purchased or bought out of slavery, and they call that redemption, that, that slave is redeemed. And certainly Paul probably had that in mind when he not only thought back to the Exodus, but when he thought thought about a spiritual exodus where we were enslaved to Satan and the domain of darkness, but we had been purchased and set free. So redemption, it means to purchase, to buy out of slavery. A price had to be made. A price had to be paid. A real transfer from slavery to freedom resulted. This is not just theoretical. Real forgiveness of sins is accomplished. Mark chapter 10, verse 45, Jesus says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. There it is. Ransom, a payment was made to set you free. Matthew 26, 28 for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of their sins. Colossians 2.13, same book, different chapter. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him, having forgiven us of all of our transgressions. This word forgiveness means to send away. If you've read our retreat last October and we listened to the teachings of Milton Vincent on forgiveness, or if John Dillard has gotten that sermon into your hands uh, and you've listened to it at all, you know that the Greek word forgiveness means literally to send away. To send away. It means to be pardoned. Psalm 103, verse 12, God says that He has cast your sins away from you and away from Him as far as the east is from the west. Micah seven nineteen says that He has cast your sins into the sea of forgetfulness. In a sense, Paul was already at work dismantling the Colossian heresy. Part of that Colossian heresy was that Jesus wasn't enough. That He wasn't fully man. He wasn't fully God. He was special, but not divine. And see, Paul's already chipping away at that Colossian heresy because only God can save. And here we see clearly that Jesus saves. Jesus is God. Only God can forgive sins. And here it says that our forgiveness is owing to Jesus Christ. Jesus is God. So he's already beginning to chip away at this Colossian heresy, but he's just getting warmed up. He's just getting warmed up. As I said, we're about to take a step forward and fall into the deep end of the ocean. The most Christ-centered portion of scripture found in the whole Bible, in my opinion. And so with that, let's transition into verses 15 through 17. And 
I said verses 12 through 14 were a combination of the work of the Father and of the Son, and we also saw the Holy Spirit in there in the regenerating agent of the Godhead. But now we're focusing exclusively upon the preeminent one, the incomparable Jesus Christ. Verses 15 through 17. He, that's Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, I don't know if you've ever had the privilege, and I say that tongue in cheek, of locking horns with a Jehovah's Witness. But this is the verse that they will go to. And it doesn't make any sense to me why they would. They are reaching for a stick of dynamite while holding a match. Because if rightly understood in the context, this verse will blow up in their face. They're trying to reach for this verse to show you and me that Jesus is special, but he's not divine. There's only one God, Jehovah, and to call Jesus God would be heresy. But let's look at this, and I hope you'll take notes. And, and look, don't go out and pick a fight with a Jehovah's Witness. But if one comes, you know, picking a fight with you, you hold, you hold your own. And, and with a winsome humility, go to this passage. Beat them to the punch bowl. They're going to try to go to it. You, you head them off at the pass, and you go there. And, and be able to articulate some things that I'm going to give you. You see, the Jehovah's Witnesses are, are working from a different Greek New Testament that they have uh, monkeyed with and have, um, uh, I'm not sure what the word is, they've, uh, they've, they've compromised it. They, they've stacked the deck into their favor. They've let their preconceived ideas of what should be written um, dictate how they've come to the Scriptures. But no amount of changing a word here or a word there can take away from the contextual flow that Paul is using here and the arguments given through Paul by the Holy Spirit. You can't take that out of the Greek. So here we go. Number one, there's a word here that's used, and it's even used in the Jehovah's Witness version of the Scriptures Proto -toko, tokos. And it's it's interesting. Paul could have used a different word, pro, protokistos, which means the first created. That was a very common word, but he doesn't. He uses this other word, which means not necessarily the first created, but the highest in rank. Now let me give you a couple of illustrations of how this is show, shows up in the scriptures. Jacob, not Esau, is called the firstborn. Now, if you know how that story went down, Esau was actually born first. But theologically speaking, it is Jacob, not Esau, who is called the firstborn. And the Greek Septuagint, translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, uses this exact word that Paul uses here, prototokos, which means highest in rank. Not necessarily sequentially first, but highest in rank. Revelation 1.5, Jesus is called the firstborn from the dead. Though technically, not chronologically, was he the first one to be raised from the dead. But he is called the firstborn, this same Greek word, because of those raised from the dead, Jesus is in a place all his own. He is highest in rank, deserving worship and reverence and preeminence. He is called the preeminent one later in this passage. Romans chapter 8, verse 29, same thing. So that Christ may be the firstborn among many brethren. And again, it's not talking about chronologically. It's talking about that he might be the chief, the highest 
Philippians 2 says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But there's another clue here. The context. If Paul was saying that Jesus is merely the first created being, special, yes, but created nevertheless, then he would be agreeing with the Colossian heretics. And if he agrees with them, then why would he write this four-chapter letter to correct the heresy that the Colossians were hearing? Why would he take such painstaking links and efforts in verses 15 through 23 to show the supremacy, the deity, the chief, the highest place that Jesus Christ should have in our lives and in our worship. There's a, there's a third clue. He says that all things were created by Jesus, through Jesus, and for Jesus. That's in verse 16. Now, how could Jesus be created if all things that are were created by him through him and for him we're not we're not making some fanciful logical smoke and mirrors argument we're following the logic and the argument that the holy spirit inspired paul to write and this isn't the first time that we've seen this logic is it we're in John chapter 18, almost hitting John chapter 19, right, Todd? But in John chapter 1, do you remember that months and months ago? Listen to, to how John put this same idea. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now listen to verse 3. All things came into being through Him, Jesus, and, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 as well. I'll, I'll have to leave you to look that up on your own, but same logic. So, whereas this group of heretics in Colossae, where, whereas modern day uh, Arianists and Jehovah's Witnesses will say, um, he was the first created, and then through him, God the Father created all these things. The logic just won't stand up to Scripture. And there's one more. As I said, all things were not just created by Jesus and through Jesus, but for Jesus. Now think about, let that sink in for just a minute. Are you with me in verse 16? For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. Not, please don't think that that means that Jesus was needy and that he created all of this stuff so he could be complete. God didn't create you. Jesus Christ didn't create you because he was lonely and needed a friend. He needed a chum. He needed someone to make his heart whole. That's not what for means here. It's not for in the sense of need, but it's for in the sense of glory. And only God deserves and demands that all glory from all of creation be given to him. Right? You with me on that? And for Jesus to then stand in that spotlight and say, everything, whether you can see it or not see it, was created for me. That is showing deity. And this is further fleshed out in verse 17. He says he's before all things. Only God is before all things. Only God is the uncaused cause of all things. And Jesus says, that's me. Verse 19 says that 
All of the fullness of deity dwells in him. And verse 15 says he is the exact image of the invisible God. Listen to Dr. MacArthur on verse 15. He says, Unlike man, Jesus Christ is the perfect, absolute, accurate image of God. He did not become the image of God at the incarnation. He has always been the image of God from all of eternity. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Christ reflects God's attributes as the sun's light reflects the sun itself. In Christ the invisible God became visible. John 1, 14, And we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father. Hmm. Just want to linger here for a moment with you. I don't know if you've thought about this for a while, that all things were created for the glory of Jesus Christ. All things Things that you can see with the naked eye. Things that you can only see with a telescope. Things that you can only see with a microscope. And things that you can never see in this life. Such as Satan and the hosts of hell. Unseen authorities and rulers and dominions. He created it all, and He created it all for His glory. That means that nothing in the universe exists for its own sake. Nothing. Everything from what you would call something very important to what you might not even realize exists. It, it all exists. It all was created by Him, through Him, and for Him. That is, for His glory. As we continue to just work our way through here, I said things seen and things unseen. So let's talk about just the things seen for a minute. And again, it might be that you can see it with the naked eye. I look around, I see a lot of people here. I see image bearers. I see this structure, right? See this microphone, this Bible, etc. There's things that I can only see through a telescope, by the way, the more powerful our telescopes become, uh, we're seeing things that just a generation earlier never knew existed. I think that pattern will just continue to go forward. But things that we can only see with a microscope. But they're things that we can see. They're not spiritual realities. That's next. Got a little devotion here that me and Caleb go through. Louis Giglio wrote this. Indescribable is the name. And I like this little devotional. I'm going to read you a couple that me and Caleb have read, Amy, Anna Grace have read recently. Um, Beetlejuice. I'm not talking about the movie with Michael Keaton. Beetlejuice is actually a star. Not just any twinkling little star, but a truly spectacular star that's approximately 640 light years away from Earth. And remember, a light year is how far light travels in one year, which is 5.88 trillion miles. So multiply 5.88 trillion by 640, and that's how far away Betelgeuse is. Betelgeuse is so big that 262 trillion Earths could fit inside this one star. But Betelgeuse isn't the biggest star that we know about. The biggest star that we know about, and I, I emphasize that we know about, is a star called Canis Majoris, which is 1.7 billion miles wide. If Earth were the size of a golf ball, Canis Majoris would be the height of Mount Everest, which is 29,029 feet tall. 
There's on the big side. Now listen to this one. We read this one just yesterday, didn't we, Caleb? An atom is the basic building block of all matter. And it's tiny, really tiny. In fact, 125 million atoms could fit inside the period at the end of a sentence. And just one cell in your body contains about 100 trillion atoms. So think about that for a moment. But then he says things get smaller because then you've got the protons and the neutrons and the electrons. And you've got the quarks and the leptons. And he says someday we'll probably find out that quarks and leptons are, simply, are, are made up of still tinier things. But this is his point. All of these tiny particles come together to make everything you see from a blade of grass to the tallest mountain to the faraway stars. Why does all of this matter? Because God, who is Lord and creator of all the hugeness of the universe, is also Lord and creator of the tiniest of things. There is nothing too big, there is nothing too small to be out of God's control. So when we think of the things seen, oh, we're not just talking about with the naked eye. That's, that's important. We're talking about things that we see with a telescope, things that we see with a microscope. And all of it was created by Jesus, through Jesus, and for Jesus. The universe as we know it. Someone said the universe is like a peanut that God carries around in his pocket. But then he goes to the things unseen. Did you see that transition in verse 16? Thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities. These are things that we can't see. Of all that Paul could have used, the Holy Spirit gave him these four categories to mention of things unseen that Christ created for his glory. Now, I won't let the cat completely out of the bag, but we're going to see this same concept come up in a few weeks. Look at Colossians 2.15. Back, so let's back up in verse 13. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt, consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him, that is through Christ. So there's an example of what Paul means. When, he went, when Jesus went to the cross... And he took your sin upon him, and your sin was nailed to the cross, and he died for you. He was defeating not just sin, not just death, but he was defeating, as Paul would say in Ephesians 6, 12, he says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against these cosmic powers of darkness the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So everything that we see, he created by him, through him, for him. And everything we don't see, Satan and his hosts were created by Jesus and for Jesus. That should give us great courage, brothers and sisters. Nothing is outside of Jesus' personal ownership. He owns it because he created it. And he created it for a purpose. And that purpose is ultimately for his glory and for our good. Nothing is outside of that scope. Next week, we will see that Jesus is also Lord, not just over creation, but he's Lord over the church. That is, he's the head of the church and we are the body we belong to him. He tells us what to do, not the other way around. That's just one more dimension and display of the glories that Paul will give to Jesus Christ. 
And then we'll wrap up verses 21 through 23 by showing in light of these glorious truths of Jesus, how should we live? How should we live in light of these staggering truths? But again, that's next week. Let's close with just a, a few points of application. First off, how is your prayer life for others? Hunter did a wonderful job last week showing us this prayer of Paul's that really starts in verse 3 of chapter 1. Now, he, he specified verses 9 through 11. But how people have prayed for you in the past. Here Paul was praying for this group of believers, and what a wonderful prayer it is. But Hunter reminded us last week that people have prayed for you in the past. And I hope you're continuing that and praying for others. I firmly believe that anytime someone is saved, it's because someone was praying for them. And you might not know who was praying for you till you get to heaven. I've told you this story before, but Miss Slish, Miss Deborah Slish, my seventh grade chorus teacher from Coosa, um, I got saved in the 10th grade and, and she heard about it and she found me and she said, Brent, I, I prayed for you for those three, you know, three years. Ever since you were in my class, I prayed for you. Now, I didn't know that. I didn't know she was a Christian. I didn't know that she was praying, but she found me and said, God answered all of those prayers I was praying for you. I said, thank you. I didn't even know you, you were praying. And she said, oh, I wanted to talk to you about Jesus so badly, but I was intimidated. But I prayed, and God heard those prayers, and God answered those prayers. So how's your prayer life? This is not to be ripped out of, of a, an affectionate, devotional heart of prayer and just set upon some cold theological shelf. Paul is praying for this group, and he's weaving theology into his prayers. How's your prayer life for other people? How's your thanksgiving to God, right? We're not just to thank Miss Debbie Slish who prayed for us. We're to thank God who heard her prayers and who moved and regenerated a dead heart and turned you from darkness into light to believe in and follow Jesus Christ. We're to thank him. That's the, the locus of the prayer as Paul says, I thank you, God. So how's your prayer life and how's your thanksgiving to God? Remember, every day you wake up, you should be thankful that you're not in hell. I'm not saying that to shock and awe. It's a fact. If you're not in hell today, you should say, thank you, God, that I'm not in hell today. And more than that, thank you that I'm a child of light and he's my father, and Jesus is my Savior and Lord. And I'm, a, I'm already a joint heir with Jesus, already. And one day when I pass away and go to glory, the best is yet to come. I'm going to get to cash in on all of that glorious inheritance, the greatest of which is fellowship with God and his Son through the Spirit for all of eternity. Second, how's your worship and all? and wonder of Jesus Christ. We've just touched the, the snowflakes on the tip of the iceberg, but wow, what, what a rapid fire succession of the glories of Jesus. He's your creator. He's your redeemer. He's God the Son who is holding it all together in the palm of his hand. He's the God who commands allegiance from all rulers and all authorities, whether they're seen or unseen. He is God himself. And one day every knee will bow and one day every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Nothing is outside of his power. Nothing is outside of his <laughs> purpose. Remember this fact in the upcoming election. Well, you'll do your homework and you'll pray and you'll go to the booths and you'll vote. But at the end of the day, you won't be on a high, high or a low, low, whoever gets put in there because Jesus Christ is on the throne. And no one can topple him from his throne. 
but also remember that in the world events. Just last night, Hunter sent me the email and said, hey, right where you and John are going, 278 children were kidnapped this week in Nigeria. And it makes me pause and wonder, should we go? We don't want to be foolish and just run into a buzzsaw for the sake of, of martyrdom. But it makes me wonder, God, why? Why are you allowing your people to suffer so? But I'm reminded that all things, all things, whether seen or unseen, are created by him and through him and for him. Remember that when there's chaos in your house, right? You don't have to look onto the news for what's happening in Nigeria. You don't have to wait till November of who's going to win the election. Sometimes we just look in our own living room and go, what in the world is happening here? Jesus Christ is Lord, and he is on the throne. And I'm not saying we don't make adjustments and we don't repent and we don't pray and ask for wisdom, but we believe in the heart of hearts that he is running this show. Remember how Piper says, put some ballast in the belly of your soul so that when the winds and waves crash against you, you will not topple over One day, every knee will bow. I said that. Why not today? Why not today? If you're here and you've never bowed the knee of your heart to King Jesus and said, I surrender. Hey, it's a fool's errand to try to fight you. I can't win, but I can win if I repent and believe in you. I can because the victory that you obtained at the cross will be my victory. Don't wait until that eschatological day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Do it now. And for those of us who have already done it, let's do it afresh and anew. I was thinking of some songs that just ooze and drip of the glory of Jesus, the preeminence of Jesus. One that we used to sing a lot at the Wells family. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. Or this one. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I won't do this one, but I'll give you a homework assignment. Stephen Curtis Chapman and Chris Tomlin have combined to write a song recently. It's called The One True God, and I encourage you to listen to that. It's a wonderfully Christ-centered song of the glory and preeminence of Jesus. Here's my last application for you. There's so much more, but remember the Father, through the work of the Son, has qualified you to share in the inheritance we already have it a little bit here best is yet to come we've already covered that i mentioned to you that one of the aspects of this glorious inheritance that's waiting on you is matthew 5 5 blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth a present reigning and ruling with christ Yes, to some degree. But the best is yet to come when we will reign and rule with Christ in the new heavens and the new earth for all of eternity. Here's my point. You don't have to have a bucket list on earth and make sure you visit this city and that city and do this and do that and do this and do that and do this and do that. And do that. If you're doing that, you're living as though this part of your inheritance isn't real. You can live for Jesus today. You can give sacrificially. You can go on mission trips. You can pray for the unreached and be used by God to spread the name and fame of Jesus. And you're not going to miss out on one thing that your friend who doesn't do any of that but just lives to vacate different continents, different uh, seven wonders of the world, and they're living as though this is all there is to it. You're not going to miss out one bit when Jesus returns 
and you reign and rule with him for all of eternity in the new heavens and the new earth. So don't live like he who dies with the most toys wins. That's a pagan mindset. That's not biblical. Don't live like I got to have my bucket list uh, checked off one by one by one or else this life was, was a waste. That's a carnal, unbelieving mindset. Live like eternity is real and that there really is a reward and an inheritance waiting on you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your love, for your plan to redeem us and to bring us to yourself through Jesus Christ. Jesus, we thank you for purchase, purchasing us on the cross and at the empty tomb. But even before your cross work, you had created us. You had created all things and it all exists for your glory and pleasure. It all exists to make much of you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we pray that you will help us to love and trust Jesus Christ above all. Holy Spirit, would you empower us to make much of Jesus in the big things and in the small things? Holy Spirit, guard us that we not drift away from Jesus only as this group of Colossae believers were tempted. Help us, Holy Spirit, to be able to say and to mean, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Jesus, we pray this in your name. Amen.